let's do some mailbag questions, Charlie. We didn't finish the oh, yeah. we didn't finish mailbag Monday. Uh, on Monday, as you know, we never once have, I don't think, in the history of this show. So let's get to uh, we have a pair of questions, both about Adder and Ginning, that I want to get to. Uh, the first one is from Philly Insider Podcast. How have you felt about Jenning Adder in the past few games? And what do you expect the pairings to be if Sealer and one of Drysdale Risto comes back? And JMU fan also said, do you think Adder or Jenning has played well enough to force themselves into being a part of the future? Also, do you think Garyana? We'll get to the Garyana of part second. Uh, just for Jenning and Adder, how do we feel about what we've seen out of this team? I have to say, you know, I was listening to... Um, I think one of the intermission reports uh, with um, with Mertidis and Smith the other day, mm -hmm. and they mentioned how these like remember Victor Mete and Louis Belpedio like they they played this year. I forgot all about yeah. that. These are the thirteenth and fourteenth defensemen to play for this team insane. so far this year, and the team has turned in some really good defensive efforts. Now, listen, it's not just about the six defensemen. It's about the forwards committing to defense. It's about the structure as a whole. But if you had just two dudes playing 15 minutes a game that didn't belong, you'd be getting blown out of the water. And that hasn't been the case for the most part since they've come into the lineup. Charlie, what do you think about the uh, Adderd and Jinning pairing? So I want to preface this because I feel like this actually will give this opinion even more credence. I want to preface this by saying I am a noted Adam Jennings skeptic, and I but I am also a noted Ronnie Adder believer. Like I am high on Adder, I am low on Jennings. I this has been the case for a really long time. I don't particularly think highly of Jennings' upside. I think he is basically his upside is in my mind has always been what Robert Haig ultimately became, not what we hoped he was going to become, but what he ultimately became, which was like a passable number seven. Adder, on the other hand, I think his upside is something like a bigger, faster Radko Gudis, which would be awesome. Um, that said, this pairing by the numbers has been doing really well. And I'm going to give you some numbers here that might surprise you because honestly, they surprised me going into last night's game. And I think they kind of only got better. So in terms of expectacles for percentage, They've been together at the NHL level for 65 minutes, uh, 67 minutes so far this this year. When they've been on the ice, the Flyers have collected 66% of the expected goals. They protect. They've 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 uh, they've generated about 59% of the shots on goal, about 59% of the shot attempts, and about 65% of the actual goals. Now, this pairing is getting sheltered to be sure. The Flyers are picking their spots with the rookies. Brad Shaw is certainly trying to avoid having them out there against top lines, understandably. But you know what you need to be doing in sheltered minutes? You need to be killing it in sheltered minutes. Like, if you're getting sheltered, like, that was the big thing that, that killed them so much with Keith Yandel. They were sheltering the hell out of Keith Yandel, and he was still getting killed, <laughs> oh which God. made it even worse. He's the worst player this, I've ever seen. <laughs> like, this pairing is getting sheltered. But in those cushy minutes, they are dominating. And that's really exciting because, I mean, I'm of the opinion with my personal bias that I think it's more Adder than Jinning. But Jinning ain't dragging them down. At the very least, they both look like NHL defensemen right now. And as a duo, they clearly have brought over the chemistry that they build up not even this year, but last year when they played together almost exclusively in the AHL. They've kind of just picked up right where they left off there just at the NHL level in the midst of a playoff race. And I'm not saying they've been perfect. They've made mistakes, but they've been a hell of a lot better than I expected them to be given the situation they were thrown into and given the stakes of the games they're playing and given the quality of the teams they've faced. I've been really impressed by them. I just love, we just had a, uh, where'd it go from baby Ray Jinning juked Rempe last night. That was really yeah. fucking funny. <laughs> and then, uh, he and just br open ice tried to make it seem like oh uh, Jinning was scared of Rempe. No, 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 no. Jinning made a good play yeah, on that. Jenning yeah, didn't get run over yeah. and held and kept possession of the puck. They got as killed. Rempe last night. went down. That was really, really good stuff. Uh, I feel that was honestly that made the Jinning thing uh, his entire call up worth it. Uh, but I, I too have been impressed. I like Charlie that you mentioned. Um, Shots on goal and shot attempts as different statistics there because obviously with Ronnie Adderd, <laughs> those two things are going to be wildly different. And there's a 4% <laughs> difference, as you noted, 
I expected it to be about 12, uh, but it's, <laughs> it seems like he's gotten the shot a little bit under control since those first couple games when he was just straight Fulton Reeve, uh, one out of five. <laughs> you ever hit the net with that thing? How about one out of five? One out of five. Like, yeah, that's so uh, I, too, have been pretty impressed uh, with those two. There's going to be at some point a backlog on the blue line again, like it's assuming we get some of these dudes healthy even into next year. Do you think either guy gets maybe an extended look or is it like, hey, next year we think Email Andre is going to be ready and next year Jamie Drysdale is going to be here the whole season, you know, hopefully barring injury and all that. Do you think there's a possibility these guys are more than just depth pieces for right now? Well, they're going to have a tough decision with Adder in particular. Like, I don't – I'm skeptical that Jinning is a guy that they really view as as more, at least for now, as more than a, like – he clears waivers, is in the minors, and is a quality recall when guys get hurt because that that's always necessary. Adder's interesting because like the one of the big reasons why they gave Zamula the shot they did this year is because he was no longer waiver exempt. He was a quality prospect for a long time. Was kind of like shit or get off the pot time. We got to figure out what we have in him or we might lose him for nothing. Well, that's kind of the situation Adder's going to be in next year. He's not going to be wa- be waiver exempt anymore. So in camp. Like, I could see him making the team as the seven who doesn't play every night, kind of the same way that Zamula was at the beginning of the year, because they don't necessarily want to risk another team grabbing a six foot three right handed shooting defenseman who can skate pretty well and also has some offensive ability. So, Adder, I think, might have a place here. I don't think they are 100% convinced he, he is part of the future, but I don't think they've ruled it out either. Jinning has impressed, but I don't know if he's impressed enough that, like, he will have anything more than like a legitimate chance to make the team out of camp in a competition. Adder to me is more interesting because I just think he has a higher upside than Jenning. Like to me, the thing that's going to hurt Jenning long-term in terms of his place with the organization is his spot is basically the spot that I think they are holding for Hunter McDonald. They love Hunter McDonald. He, he just signed a, an ATO with the Phantoms. He's going to start his, his pro career full-time next year. They're both left-handed shooting defensemen who don't bring a lot of offense or defensively oriented guys, except Hunter McDonald is meaner and hits harder than Jenning. So I just think he might ultimately get pushed out by McDonald, whereas Adder's skill skill set is a little bit rarer, especially because he's a right-handed shooting guy, but it even goes beyond that. Like he's just a kind of a unicorn type defenseman. So I think Adder might be pushing himself into the conversation more, but let me put it this way. I think a month, a month and a half ago, Jenning wasn't even in the conversation. Like there were very reputable rumors that he was considering going back to Sweden at the end of the season. Now, suddenly like he's showing he can at least hold his own at the NHL level. He might have pushed himself at least back into the conversation and good for him. I was just going to ask you about those Sweden rumors because we got a question in the chat if there was like some sort of signed contract or anything. I just remember seeing those rumors, but I don't remember if there was like anything to them other than, yeah, he's not really in the Flyers' future plan, so he's just going to like go back home because what's well, the point? Well, so, so speaking to that, because I do want to point this out, um, this is something that happens with European guys, and, and this is what, I mean, my understanding is this is what happened with Diego Zamula. Zamula, more or less, with his camp, kind of told the Flyers, like, look, if I don't, if I'm not going to get a shot, I'm just going to go home. And it, it, it can be viewed as a threat, and it is to a degree, but it's also just a fact. Like, hey, I'm only here because I want to be an NHL. If you don't give me a real shot to be an NHL, or like, I'll just go home and make money in my home country. And I have a feeling that Jenning kind of might have did the same thing, which is sort of like, look, like, I'm happy for the opportunity, but if it's just not going to work here, I'm just going to go back to Sweden and have a nice 10-year career in the SHL. It would not shock me in the slightest if that was floated to the Flyers and might have played a role in him getting this look. But again, good for him. He's kind of running with it. If that's what happened, he he's earned the right to be back in the conversation again. It's funny. I just uh, remembered, didn't something similar happen with Bobrovsky after the Brzezgalov signing? He yeah. was like, I'm never signing here. So trade me or I'm going home. Like yeah, That's why they traded him. Yeah, so that's why they ended up just like, all right, well, see ya. Um, the Garyanov well, part of the JMU fan question, 
Do you think uh, Garyanov gets another look over Lixell at some point in these last 10 games? There's nine left now. He says, we were told they were going to give Garyanov a look, but he got a few games. Do you think he gets back in at all? Well, I mean, first off, guys might get hurt. If everybody stays healthy, maybe not. Lixell has shown flashes. I do think they are probably more invested in Lixell because they drafted and developed him. Gurionov's just like a dude they got in a trade because they took a flyer on him. And like, you never know who could be the next Vili Leno, so why not? <laughs> but look, I don't think the Flyers are in love with Oli Lixell either. And if he has three or four games where he just stinks, yeah, I think they would put Gurionov in. I think honestly, the more interesting question, and this is a question I'll throw to you guys. Do you think there's any chance that Cam Atkinson gets into another game the rest of the year? Wow. Man, we talked about that a little. Um, that was a mailbag question on Monday. Maybe if they clinch, or like you said, there are injuries, but ah, th- how can you? I think it's injuries at this point because, I mean, like, I- I'd rather see Will Excel, to be honest with you, out there. I mean, like, they're, or Garyanov, to be honest with you. So I-, I just don't see how you can. No, there's a lot of. Like, we talked about Bobby Brink kind of this way. Um, if, if neither Brink nor Atkinson are going to give me anything, and Brink's been good lately. I'm just, yeah. like, at the time, Brink right. wasn't playing great. It's like, I'd rather, I know, one, Atkinson, not part of the future, just based on age, contracts, et cetera. Right. Two, uh, like, if neither's giving me anything, I want the ch- guy with the chance of potentially one day giving me something. That could be Garyanov. That could be Lixell. Probably not, but you don't know. Like, Cam Atkinson, it does, what's the point? Yeah. Like, other than he's a veteran, the respect, all that, which does go a long way in locker rooms. You can't totally write it off. But from a winning games perspective, I, there's probably three dudes on the Phantoms I'd rather see more than Cam Atkinson. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> I, it's not fair. I'm just, you know. No, it, it, it is what it is. I mean, I guess, you know, time comes for us all. And um, maybe Atkinson with a with a strong summer uh, can can bring himself back into being a, an every night NHL caliber scoring forward. But the guy we saw for the month before his most recent round of scratches was not that, unfortunately. And I no, like him a lot. It does he seem like it was a lot of mental with Cam. I mean, he went 14 or 15 games with scratches in there. Zero points. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know, man. Like, everyone picks up a point here and there. <laughs> it's not, it, like, you know, except, like, Eric Johnson, who has no, three goals, no assists. <laughs> that was incredible <laughs> when the Flyers acquired him. But, like, yeah, defensive defenseman who's 37 years old. You know? yeah. Like, that's what we're talking about. And he's putting up the same numbers as top six winger Cam Atkinson. You can't do it. <laughs> uh, before we move on, let me tell you about our friends at FOCO. Listen. Ooh. It's here, man. Baseball season. See, I got the new cap. Uh, we, uh, you got you to gotta check out FOCO because FOCO has the absolute best officially licensed gear for all sports and fandom. <coughs> excuse me. And, and fandoms. And with baseball season here, man, you got to gear up. It's always fun when a new season begins. Get something to make it feel new to you as well. Whether it's a hoodie, jacket, beachwear, even overalls. There's something for almost every occasion. And if you're, in the, if you're in the market for some accessories, toys, or collectibles for your man cave, she shed, or podcast set, you've got to use FOCO for all your team gear needs. FOCO always has our back for Philly sports, and they have yours too. Get the best gear around. Get the best gear around. The link in the description of the show. And for all non-presale items, use promo code PHLY10. That's promo code PHLY10 for 10% off at FOCO today. And I know football season's still months away. Get your velour sweatsuits. <laughs> Absolutely, freaking lutely got to get a velour sweatsuit from Foco. Um, where, where's my next question here? Oh, okay. So this is where I want to talk about torts. Uh, okay, here we go. Charlie, don't – I know you, you you let the guy walk all over you, this soft Philly Flyers media and everything, but we're, we're going to have to – it's so funny that – I love this, like, when there's controversies like this, I see comments to our show – like Charlie's replies, there's like one dude like, oh, he just doesn't respect the soft Philly media. And then I see another comment like, why do you guys bag on Torts so much? <laughs> I, I bet him to win the Jack Adams, and I think he legitimately deserves it. But yeah. like, I don't know, man. When for the third time this season, you put out your fourth line for overtime, and then you never see the puck and get scored on and lose, maybe he should answer for it. 
The captain has to be, you know, nonstop accountability. How come the coach doesn't? But whatever. Let's get into uh, <laughs> let's get into this question from Ed Helinski. Could John Tortorella be done after this season and coach and move to a front office job with the Flyers? That would be shocking. <laughs> it, it, I, it's like they flirted around with that before. Like remember when he was in the box last I year? Think, I, like it, last it's year always been, hap- been like an idea, you know? Yeah. No, last year it happened at the end of the year where he was up in the press box evaluating with Danny Briere and everything. And for whatever reason, he's sending his assistants out now a lot to address the media. Maybe it's just to give those guys some shine, uh, you know, for potential head coaching jobs this offseason, whatever it might be. I think it's going to happen eventually. Okay. But I, I don't see a dude. I mean, He's he's trying to fight official. Like I don't That's see a dude. Saying. I don't see a dude ready to come out from behind the bench all no. that soon. Do you, Charlie? Yeah, you know what I can tell you is that I've heard nothing around the organization to tell to to tell me or even hint that they are planning to kick towards upstairs or that there have been conversations internally. Now they might just be hiding all this. They did a good job of hiding the Cutter Gauthier stuff. So hey, like sometimes things just just are hidden well. So maybe, but I can say that my read is that they fully expect John Tortorella to be the head coach to start next season. Now, look, who knows what happens the next season? You know, we couldn't predict it half the things that happened this year. So who the hell knows how next season plays out. So I'm only willing to, to speculate on what happens this off season. However, the only thing I, I can throw out is like, and this is again, I've said this multiple times over the last couple of weeks. I do not want to put myself in the head of John Tortorella. However, <laughs> could I plausibly see a scenario where John Tortorella has decided in his head that he is done after this year and just hasn't told anybody? Just like how he didn't really tell anybody until a couple of days before they named Couturier captain that he wanted to name Couturier captain. Like, maybe. You never know. I don't know what John Tortorella is thinking. I will say that, like, if he has decided – that he's going to retire at the end of the season. Like it would make the, the decisions of the last couple of weeks make a little bit more sense. Cause it's like, well, I don't give a shit about blowing up a locker room because I'm going to be gone in a couple of weeks. And Hey, I don't care about media relations anymore because I'm out of here in a month anyway. So who gives a shit? I don't think that's the case. I just think this is John Tortorella being John Tortorella, but I can understand why someone could watch the events of the last few weeks from afar and start thinking, I wonder if this this is just towards going full scorched earth because he knows he's gone in a month. I get why people might surmise that. I do not think that's going to happen. At the very least, I don't think that the Flyers think that's going to happen. But you never know. This is the Flyers. They're the chaos organization. You never know. Got to keep that seat warm for Craig Berube. Come on. I, yeah, Got to get chief. I mean, as as much as everyone loves torts, he's not a former flyer. And <laughs> <laughs> listen, you can only hold that position so long, uh, you know? bud. You know, um, I want to take this while we're talking about John Tortorella. Charlie, what do you make of this? Like, just he, le- I mean, the obvious answer is he just doesn't give a shit. But Occam's razor, baby. Yeah, like that's he doesn't. We know this, um, but he has to address the media, doesn't he? <laughs> like this is ridiculous. One would think. Um, look, I don't want to go into too many details about this because this is something like I'm dealing with behind closed doors. There's also, and this is something I've articulated in in our Discord. Again, become a diehard during the Discord. I've articulated this in our Discord. One of the reasons why I. Because I get people in my mentions sometimes being like, why aren't you holding John Tortorella accountable? Like, and I guess that presumably means on Twitter for not talking to you guys. Why are you letting him get away with this? It's very hard as a member of the media to be commenting on things where you yourself have a vested interest in what it is. Like, if a media person like me goes on Twitter and starts complaining about like John Tortorella won't talk to me, there is no way that I don't come across as white. There is no way. There is no way that I don't come across as sounding like an entitled media elite who thinks that I deserve everything at all times. Like it's impossible. Like that's just the way it's always going to come across. So I try to avoid having these confrontations, discussions, whatever you want to call them in public. I don't think it's the right way to do it. B, 
because to me, no one comes out looking good. However, the coach has to talk to the media. Like this is to me, like this isn't, and this isn't a, well, the media isn't feels entitled. It's a sense of entitlement. Like this is part of the head coach's job. Like I, I, I think it would be maybe received differently in Philadelphia. If like, the Eagles lost a tough game to the Cowboys and Nick Sirianni just decided not to talk. Like I, I would have to say that would be nuts. And that's kind of like what this is not to the same degree, because obviously one out of 82 isn't as important as one out of 16 and the flyers will never be the Eagles in this city or just in the country. And also the way the leagues are run, Roger Goodell would put Nick Sirianni in football jail. Exactly. But no, exactly. man, this is a TV show. Uh, you yeah. need to do the TV show thing. And the NHL doesn't give a shit. They probably think it's funny. Yeah, but it is part of the head coach's job to stand up after the game and talk about the decisions the head coach made. Like, I was the one who asked Bradshaw the question about three on three overtime and about the line combinations. And I prefaced it by basically being like, this is probably a better question for Torts, but. And I didn't say, but we don't have him, so I have to ask you. But, like, that was more or less what I was getting at. Like, honestly, it was kind of unfair for me to ask Bradshaw that question because it wasn't Bradshaw's decision. It was John Tortorella's decision. Unfortunately, I didn't really have a choice because John Tortorella wasn't there and you have to ask someone. Like, it's it's a question that had to be asked. It was very much pivotal to the outcome of the game. I kind of felt bad I had to ask Bradshaw because Bradshaw shouldn't have to answer that. John Tortorella should have to answer that. And if John Tortorella wants to answer that with, I'm the coach, no comment, fine. That's an answer. It's a non-answer, but it's an answer. But I do think that he has to answer those questions because the fans deserve an explanation as to why the coach made the decisions that impacted the team that they care so much about. That That's the way I look at it. It's just I'm not going to make a big thing out of it on Twitter or social media or whatever because I don't think it's becoming of anyone in the situation. Do you think, and again, can't get in John Tortorella's head even if you tried, um, this is part of the whole, well, they're now they're talking about me, so they're not talking about five of the last nine shots Sam Erson faced going in. Like, could it be the day before mm. he had to apologize for what he said about his goaltender? So you know what? I'm going to do this other thing. Like, I... I'm just trying to come up with reasons here. I don't know. It's fucking John Tortorella. He's nuts. Taking the track. I I don't (laughs) think it's that calculated. If I had to guess, honestly, like if I wanted to give you my honest answer as to why I think John Tortorella didn't talk to the media, I think it, I think it might actually have something to do with the Sandstrom thing in that I think Tortorella was extremely frustrated and angry with the fact they lost the game because he's a hyper competitive person and was afraid that if he went up in front of the media, he would say something that he was going to regret. And therefore his thing was, well, I'm just not going to talk to him. And like, I don't think this was a calculation of, well, it'll be a distraction because they'll be talking about me. I don't think it's that calculated. I think it is more single minded. And whether that single mind was, I hate the media right now, so I ain't giving them shit. Or that single mind was the last time I went up there angry, I accidentally threw my backup goalie who probably shouldn't even be the NHL right now under the bus. So I'm not going to do that again. So I'm just going to avoid talking. I think it's probably more likely to be something like that. That's just my theory, but that's my theory. So look, I wasn't alive for Buddy Ryan, but has there (laughs) been a coach more polarizing than John Torrell since then? Man, that's... We're always talking about him. Yeah, we all. I mean, he is again like when, wild stuff too. when we write the head. When I write the headline for the show to go up on YouTube, always supposed to use a team name and a like a, either the coach or a player name. I would bet the person I've used most by far this year is John Shorts. Tortorella's name. Like <laughs> he is the face of the franchise. Literally. It's like Tortorella, probably gritty, <laughs> and, and then like Travis Connectman. Like that's <laughs> that Travis Connectman. Fair. I, it's it's. He's polarizing, and he's he's front and center, and it's just kind of odd that he ain't talking right now. We all silly like the mayor. 